Hello everybody, welcome to the TriStar Gym channel. Today I have the most special guest of all time, the great John <laughs> Danaher, my mentor, my teacher, my great friend. John, thank you for being on the channel. My pleasure for us, thank you. John, I have a new website coming out. It's called ArabFanatics.com. I really much want you to be a part of it. Are you, are you in? Um, uh, let me uh, consult BJV fanatics. <laughs> Why is it okay for them to be fanatics and not us? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a good uh, offered answer for us. Guys, check out John's stuff on BJJ fanatics. We just released Mount, correct? Ah, uh, yes. <clears throat> I I uh, I produce uh, instructional videos for Jiu Jitsu and BJJ fanatics sells them. Guys, the greatest mind in Jiu Jitsu on BJJ fanatics. Make sure to check him out. John, I want to ask you first thing, serious question. I want to, I want, first actually, I want to talk about how I, how I heard about you first. Many, many years ago, I was, of course, training with George, and uh, he went to New York, and he told me, I got tapped out five times in five minutes by a guy named John. And that, you were still rolling back then, yes. regularly. You were still training hard and, and rolling back then. And I was like, five times in five minutes? It's like impossible. Now, at that time, we had rolled it with a few black belts already. Jiu-Jitsu was just kind of starting up in Montreal. There was only one or two black belts in the city. And I had rolled with black belts and George rolling with black belts. And we weren't getting tapped that much. So I really didn't believe George. I thought maybe, you know, it was more in his head. And, you know, he was just maybe overly excited or whatnot. And then I remember going down to meet you for the first time. Actually, we trained together the first time. It was Las Vegas, I believe. It was at Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Was it the BJ pin, the first BJ pin fight? Uh, was it? Was it that fight? I believe it may have been. Right. So it was the first time I cornered George. Okay, and okay. It was the yeah. first time I met you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we ended up rolling together. I remember we went on like a, was it like a Friday morning or something when George was weighing and we, we went we downstairs. Went to wrestle. And yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember you like tapping me out like every 30 seconds. <laughs> but you were, you were just a young man. Like, yeah, yeah. But still, I mean, we we're still tough. You know, we're obviously, we're competing at UFC level, training at that level. We had, and we were just getting crushed. And we're like, man, your jiu-jitsu was so sophisticated. And you started training at the age of 20, 28. 28. Yeah. So, I mean, you started late in life. John started very late in life. And it was incredible how sophisticated your jiu-jitsu was very early on. Like, how, how did you develop your system? Um, well, uh, the main thing I looked at was to look at what, what, are the, what is the founding principle of the sport. And... Um, for most people in those days, it was the idea of position before submission. Yeah. And um, I thought that was a, a wonderful, succinct way of, of putting it. And I think it was very effective for most people. Um, but I, I thought to myself, well, when they talk about position, what do they really mean? And what you clearly see is what, what's meant by the idea of position is control. And when it dawned on me that the real way of expressing it was not position before submission, but control before submission. Then you got to understand mm. there are many ways to, to control the human body that go far beyond just the simple positional game of jiu-jitsu. And that position, sorry, that control can be exerted from top, bottom, standing ground, anywhere. And once I started saying, okay, let's put the emphasis on control before submission rather than just position. Position is just a subset of control. Mm, it's too vague of a term, almost. Uh, it, it was actually it's, it's pretty well uh, clarified in Jiu-Jitsu in terms of the positional structure, side control, north south, etc. Mm. It, it's pretty well defined, but the problem was it was just a subset of what's possible. And once you started to expand that and bring in the idea of ashigurami, leg controls from bottom position, uh, clamp controls from for upper body, there, there were just so many things you could do. And once that was uh, my mindset, my submission rate went up exponentially. <sighs> Yeah, I remember like you were doing leg locks even before the DDS movement, way yeah. before. You were always into leg locks. You've never shunned the leg locks ever. Yeah. And uh, uh, that was, I was fortunate fairly early in my career to meet um, Dean Lister. Um, we only met for a few minutes after a class when he was in New York. And he mentioned to me, uh, I watched him roll. And um, uh, I was impressed by the fact that he was putting a heavy emphasis on, on lower body submissions, which was unheard of in those days. Mm. And um, Actually discouraged even. Yeah, actively discouraged, yes. And um, uh, when I talked to him about it, he said, you know, why would you ignore 50% of the human body? And I was saying, that makes absolute sense. Like, why would you? And uh, then you literally double your chances the moment you do that. Your opportunities. In fact, it's not even a question of doubling your chances. Most 
opponents when you're playing bottom position look to stand up on you and so the upper body submission game more or less disappears and uh, so you're not even doubling your chances you're quadrupling your chances by attacking the lower body first when uh, because most of the time your opponent will be standing as you play in bottom position and the legs are right there in front of you to attack and um, insights like those made a, a significant impact on my game fairly early on you were always into leg locks and as far as I can remember, when I met you, you were already into leg locks. Dean Lister won a world championship with them, actually, in Abu Dhabi, right? That's he finished correct. with a leg lock. Uh, he, uh, he won two ADCCs. With a leg lock. Um, not all by leg lock. Dean had a, a good overall game. He wasn't just mm. a leg lock guy. Um, but he, his most well-known victories against his toughest opponents mostly came from leg lock. And then there was a quantum leap forward in leg locks that I saw you go through. Like, there was... Your time before we met, you're already doing leg locks. Then when we met you, you were doing leg locks, but we were heavy into MMA tactics and tactics. And then after that, after George retired, or just before, right, right around that time, there was a quantum leap in your game in leg locks, I noticed. And then DDS. Um, not, not so much a quantum leap in the game as a quantum leap in the rec uh, recognition and among my students. There's a simple reason for this. Um, I was mostly known prior to the squad as uh, someone associated with you and George mm. who would help TriStar athletes in their grappling. That's mostly what I was known for. Um, then that switch, when Chris Weidman rose to, rose to prominence, it was TriStar and Chris Weidman. Mm. And, um, uh, and then George retired. Uh, Chris moved away to open up his own gym in Long Island. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I had no MMA students. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Mm -hmm. uh, a group of very talented young men, uh, Eddie Cummings, Gary Tonin, and Gordon Ryan. They were all very, very young in those days. Um, I think Eddie came in as a blue belt. Um, Gary, I think, was a, a brown belt, and uh, Gordon was a blue belt. Mm -hmm. And they came in. They brought also with them Gordon's younger brother, Nicky, who I believe was around 13 years old at that time. Mm -hmm. And... Um, for the first time, I had students who were training with me seven days a week, mm -hmm. two or three times a day. Mm -hmm. Now, with George and yourself, it was a question of me going to Montreal or you coming to New York. Yeah. So we would see each other like once a month. Yeah. Now, the leg lock game is a very subtle game. Yeah. The difference between winning and losing with a leg lock is very, very fine. Mm -hmm. And so this is not something you're going to learn by doing it once a month. Mm. In addition... You and I both have a shared philosophy of if it's not broke, don't fix it. Mm. George was already winning yeah. so well with a top pressure game based around yeah. his double leg and shoot box that it would have been foolish to teach him a bottom leg lock game. Mm. It would be, and it would have been a distraction for him rather than a benefit. But with these youngsters, I got to work with them seven days a week, twice a day. Um, and MMA, you have to learn so many things. Yes. And, and there's so many moving parts to leg locks. Like if you want to learn leg locks, guys, you gotta you gotta do an intensive leg it's lock it's journey. Like an immersion thing. Is you have to immerse immerse yourself because there are a lot of details, and you need five things to go right. As in an armbar, you need three things to go right. In a, in a in a basic leg lock, you need five things to go right. And when you get more sophisticated, you need six, seven, eight things to go right. And and to the guy who's doing them every day, it's easy to do. But to an MMA guy who's yeah. learning so many other skills. That extra two, three elements eats up time. It eats up practice time. So I think and it wasn't for, like George needed it. He was no, he was exactly. So. It wasn't uh, super crucial for him. Yeah. Interestingly, George did pull one beautiful Ashigaru. I mean, a fight. He never got any recognition for it uh, against for Hardy when Hardy. he slipped off his back. Yes, he yes. also uh, went into Josh. Uh, not, not sorry. Um, Koscheck. Koscheck. Yeah. Uh, Koscheck's legs. Yes, also, he went yeah. for a straight foot. Yeah. Okay, we're just going to finish up. We're doing a podcast. We'll catch up with you guys. Okay. All right? Okay, but yeah, we're here for a fight, guys, today. So, uh, again, finally, we're working together again. Uh, really excited about that. But like I wanted to uh, mention, there was a time, I remember training with Eddie Cummings. And, you know, John teaches everything from Dars to leg lock. He always taught everything. You never, sh you never d dismissed any submission. Like, you, you had a holistic game. Like, for instance, like Marcelo Garcia, he used to tell... He used to tell he, he, I've had I've trained with him a couple of times. He used to tell me, "Don't do leg locks." So like, it's not it's not really a, a good idea. It doesn't really work on everybody. He had a, he had a philosophy where if it doesn't work on everybody, I don't want to do that submission. He had a, a a set of submissions he really believed in, and he kind of not didn't practice the others. You had a very different approach. 
uh, it was like know every sub. Know every sub, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. you, you, you I, emphasize I, knowing yeah. every single I, major I, I sub. Think that, I think there's wisdom to what Marcelo said. I, I, I'm not saying it's a, a wrong way of doing things. He was obviously incredibly successful with it. Um, I do believe in the idea of specialization and understand that ultimately, at the end of the day, I teach basically six families of submission holds. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not a huge number, but the number of variations within each is huge. Um, what I do believe is that if you look at, say, for example, Marcelo's career, almost all of his losses came to moves which he refused to, mm -hmm. to teach. The darts from Murillo? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's from uh, 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 Braulio? Uh, no, from um, uh, Robert. Uh, Robert Drysdale. But he also got darts from uh, Braulio, if I remember correctly. No, that was uh, from the rear neck. He got an Ezekiel from the back. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. But again, it was a shoulder strangle. A shoulder so, strangle, uh, okay. He, he always said you should never incorporate the shoulder. Into yeah, strangles. even Katakatami. He didn't yeah, want Katakatami. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, he's a brilliant guy. Nothing negative to say about Marcelo. He's one of the greatest of all time, no doubt whatsoever. We're just comparing philosophies. He also said that Kimura was a, uh, not a move that should be studied in detail. Yeah. And he was finished by Kimura. He was um, finished by Kimura by Jacare. Yeah. I believe, yes. I believe the, um, the general pattern in, in grappling is that when you tend to dismiss moves, you'll be the one that ends up getting finished by them. And so. uh, one of your students, Gary Tonin, finished, um, what's his name again? Dylan Dennis by leg lock. Yes. Yeah. Because think about it, imagine you're in a practice room and nobody does leg locks. It's going to be hard. To then think. you go in competition it's and you meet tough. a leg locker. Yeah. I mean, I tell my students, get to purple belt. After purple belt, you can, speci you, you, you can become specialized. I don't know if you agree with this, but like I make my students do armbar, triangle, omoplata, like every, do everything. Don't specialize until you get to purple belt. If you want to say, okay, I'm a leg locker, wait till you get to purple belt. Don't start as a blue belt and be a leg locker because you, like a quick thought experiment, quick thought experiment. If let's say, for instance, Gordon Ryan went to train with Marcelo instead of you and he didn't go through a leg lock era. I don't think he would have been as great as he is. Why? Because he would have played butterfly guard. And the guys he was fighting against already had 10 years more butterfly guard experience yeah. than him. Yeah. Whereas when you taught him an Ashigrami game, nobody knew that game. We're going to get to that later because I, I still want to go back to the leg lock leap, the quantum leap that I feel happened in the Henzo Gracie Academy. I'll share you with you my experience um, because I saw a huge contrast. Yes, there was always leg locks, but there was a period where there was a complete change. And the game was now different, especially... Lifting your opponent up from under, on top of you and then switching to a cross ashy was, I've never seen it before until mm -hmm. I saw you guys one day doing it in, at Hensel's and I had no idea what to do against it. And I feel like a lot of the competitors didn't know either. Like uh, when I see the, the DDS, your, your squad go up against these guys, they had no idea what to do. They didn't have five, 10 years of experience with this. They've never seen it before. It was novel. And it was catching a lot of people off guard. And I felt if Gordon didn't have that, he maybe wouldn't have had the time to develop other parts of his game that kept him on top. But he got on top by knowing something. Very sophisticated, in my opinion. Now, I'll tell you guys why, okay? I remember rolling with Eddie Cummings before. Um, in, in my opinion, there was this overnight quantum leap in, in leg lock uh, methods. Because I was doing leg locks with you. And then I remember one time you put me with Eddie Cummings, and I was like, oh, not Eddie, it's going to be an easy round for me. I had rolled with him previous. I remember, I met Eddie when he was very early in his career. Like I just kind of rolled with him. Nice guy, very intelligent guy, sweet guy. Uh, but at that time, when I first rolled with him, he wasn't uh, experienced. The second time I rolled with him, it was like maybe six months or eight, a year later, not more than a year later, I came back to roll. And I rolled with Eddie and he just crushed me with leg locks. Yeah. And I was like surprised because I had no idea what he was doing. And he was doing stuff like didn't exist a year ago. And I know uh, he was sp spending like eight hours a day with you. Didn't exist. Uh, in Eddie because Eddie came in fairly early in his development. Right, but you, you also had, you had tweaked the game quite a bit. You had, you had, yeah. you had you, like lifting a guy up and growing cross sash. I mean, that was fairly yeah. new the, from, from the, that. There, there were a bunch of core insights that, that uh, changed the game. Um, one of them was that uh, I, I was a, a very early advocate of Kandi Basami, the scissor takedown mm -hmm. into leg locks from standing position. Um, whenever Henzo would put me and match me against wrestlers in the standing position, I would use that as a means of taking a standing game immediately down to the ground. For those of you who don't know, it's a, like a flying scissor. It's the flying you scissor. jump into a leg lock from yeah. standing position. Yeah. You jump into a leg lock. It's sort of illegal now. It's, right? a, it's, it's illegal in most styles yeah. except for professional grappling right. and MMA. 
Um, Gary won with it in Abu Dhabi as well, yes. did it beautifully. It's a, it's a fantastic move in terms of effectiveness. However, it is also a very dangerous move that has an extremely high injury rate associated mm. with it. And uh, in, in a classroom setting, so many people were injured by it that I had to ban it as, mm. a, uh, as a technique in class. From standing um, position? From standing position. Why? Because when you're standing, you're bearing weight on the leg. And uh, the movement into Kani Basami, if you miscalculate time and distance, you can crash with 100% of your body weight into your training partner's knee and destroy their knee by accident. You blow the ACL. You, get, you destroy the guy's career. So we couldn't use it in the standing position. In, in a crowded room, 100 people in every class, it's, it's, uh, it's inevitable that you're going to have disasters every day in, in training. So a question began to emerge. Would there be a safe way of employing Kani Basami? The move works, but it's too, da too damn dangerous for, for, for training. Um, and the answer was yes, from bottom position. If you can elevate someone because you are underneath them, their leg is not bearing weight at the time you enter. So there's no danger of injury, but you get the same scissor technique into mm -hmm. your training partner's legs from bottom position. So you had all the virtues of Kani Basami, the control of a cross arch position, the complete control between the knee and the hip, and the safety of a butterfly guard sweep. And so it was the perfect marriage and enabled students to be able to uh, easily get underneath the opponent's body weight using butterfly guard, elevate them, and go into this uh, uh, cross arching ground and, position. And it's amazing because at, at that time, you were neighbors with Marcelo. And in my opinion, at that time, no gi jiu-jitsu, the best place in the world was, was Manhattan to train. There's no doubt. He was developing butterfly guard. You were developing butterfly guard literally in the same neighborhood. And your butterfly guards were so different. Uh, his was a positional butterfly guard, right. mine was a submission butterfly guard. Right, yeah. but it all, yours would end up in a sweep or submission as well, because if you, if you get the candy Basami, you're going to sweep. Yeah. The least. second big insight, this is where Faraz is really going, he's, he's saying like, what, what changed in that time? The, the, the second critical insight was the idea of double trouble, that 90% of resistance to any given leg lock comes from the other leg. And so if you can control both legs, the degree of control which an athlete can exert over the other uh, person is exponentially higher. Most people, when they get into a leg lock position, only focus on the leg inside their ashigurami. My philosophy was control the other leg. The leg that's inside your ashigurami can take care of itself later. So instead of leg locks being a speed-based game where you get to a leg and try and finish as fast as possible, it'd be switched to become a control-based game where my students could control both legs for extended periods of time and turn an ashigurami type position into a situation where you had the same kind of control that you would from side control or mount position or, or north-south. When, when you can dictate time and pressure, you're going to win in the sport of jiu-jitsu. If you're rushing for your submissions, you might win one, you might lose one. But when you can control people over time in ways that lead into submission, you're going to be damn good at the sport. And that was the major difference that you felt as, as time went by. That you were getting stuck in positions where you're in cross arch, both legs are laced together, and you just feel like... I, I was going from on top, a position I love, to my legs wrapped up together and on my hips no longer putting weight on yeah. my opponent, which was, I've never seen entries like that until now. I, I'm, I, now I do them religiously. Now I, like, I'm on board. Like, I love I loved the, the idea. And if you get to that Kenny Bissami position, it doesn't matter how hard he sprawls. It doesn't matter how strong they are. It's, it's irrelevant. They've, they've been now, the playing, playing field is level. Actually, it's in your favor because you also have the inside heel hook. One mistake on their part and their knee is gone. It was very frightening, very uh, scary type of guard to, to even attempt to, uh, to pass because if you get lifted up, they're underneath you. And it was incredible. But the, the other incredible, I find, major leap that the death squad did. You know, by the way, I also want to talk about the history of the death squad after that, after this. But also the back attacks. I noticed that, oh my God, man, the back attacks. When we were doing MMA together and all that, we had very strong control like john was always about control 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 but we were not as good finishers as the dds obviously because they were focusing on finishing so much more than us and, and we were focused more on takedowns and striking and then control on the ground of course but there was a leap forward in back control and back finishes as well like i mean I, look i've trained with gordon there's nothing you can do to stop his back attack like mm -hmm. i feel like there's yeah. nothing you can do 
and trapping the arm, putting the triangle on top, all these things, these new uh, subtleties you guys added over, like seemingly in a year or so, like overnight almost it felt. Actually, it was, it was uh, longer than that. Um, my interest in that control came from when you and I were preparing George to fight BJ Penn. Yeah. Um, I was looking at video of BJ Penn mm -hmm. in preparation. Um, my main job for, uh, I was George's grappling coach, uh, for us would organize the camp overall. He was the head coach and he would delegate responsibility to individual coaches for specialized areas. So for us, ran, ran the program and then would say, John, we've got problems here, here and here in grappling. And I would research and give answers and other coaches would assist in, in, in similar ways. Um, uh, when I studied BJ Penn, it was becoming clear that he had a very good back control for that time. Um, it was one of the strongest parts of his game. And my biggest fear is that George would end up in bottom position and end up exposing his back to BJ Penn. And BJ had a very high finishing rate. For that was back. the one way he could finish anybody. Yeah. And um, uh, I noticed in m several notable occasions, BJ would use his very impressive flexibility to pass a foot I over his that. opponent's arm and trap it. And then it would aid in the strangle. Yeah. Um, now, when I looked at this, it was clear that BJ had extraordinary levels of hip flexibility and he could reflexively without any effort just take his foot and hook it over his training partner's arm from almost any position and uh, uh and and strangle them so this to me was fascinating and i played around with it on the mats and with my students of the of the time and um uh it became clear that uh, i i'm a person of very average flexibility and uh, I could not do it in the same way that BJ was doing it. And so uh, I devised a, a series of simple hand traps. Then I started to realize that the key to hand trapping was to take an opponent's arm and bring it below the line of their pectorals, like so. And that hand traps, BJ could do it when the, the hand was above because of his extraordinary flexibility. But for people of average flexibility, the hand had to be brought below the line of the pectorals. And uh, the best way of doing this was not what most people were doing at that time, which was straight hand grips, but rather cross hand grips, and ultimately leading to a, a hand position known as double cross, which fed into uh, some very, very strong hand controls, which greatly increased the number of strangles taken from back position. I'm sure many people watching this podcast have had the frustrating experience of getting behind someone, getting two hooks in, maybe even locking a body triangle, and you just can't break through your opponent's defensive hands. The guys are just constantly clawing at your hands, and you can't get through to strangle people. Um, our whole thing was never be satisfied with the back pin by itself, but rather ruthlessly seek to pin your opponent's arms into a position where they cannot form effective defenses. Um, Gordon proved to be extraordinarily adept at this. It was one of the great strong points of his game. All of my students were good at it, but Gordon in particular was mm -hmm. very, very strong at it. And None uh, against one, as you see. Yes. You gotta get all his, he has no more defenses and you have still one yeah. attack left. It's, it's a brilliant system. Actually, you go over it on BGJ Fanatics, correct? On yeah. your, on your back, yeah. back attack video. Uh, it's a brilliant system, but it was a major leap forward because at that time, we were all just trying to kind of fight the hands and just just throw your arm in there and squeeze. And it was, oh, it was there, more, there, there were other people too, like uh, Marcelo Garcia would often use a foot, but it was done more intuitively. Like, mm. you, there wasn't there, a system. There was it. an opportunity and he would yeah. throw a foot and catch yeah. it and, uh, and he, had success. He interestingly, interestingly has an MMA fight where he was on the back of the, his opponent for like, I don't know, maybe five minutes. Mm. I couldn't get the the, the the choke sunk, but also it's MMA, it's much harder because the glove yeah, it changes creates things. an obstruction. Yeah. And BJ's system of wrapping that arm, the way he did it was incredible because once that arm is there, you're either going to spin into a triangle, which what happened kind of with Matt Hughes, even though Matt Hughes got out of it later, or because you guys were very strong also on putting the triangle up on the neck That's early correct. on, yeah. much earlier, like... Now today, you see it much more often in jiu-jitsu, but you guys really made that trend popular yeah. because getting the try. I remember actually Gordon coming in at TriStar when he was just a purple belt, and he was showing it to us, and I was like, man, how are you going to get your legs up there? He was doing it actually from um, side control, from half guard, from back. He was putting the triangle up on the upper body facing the opposite way. So for, let's say I have your back, and I put you in a triangle, and I'm still on your back. And it's funny. I was just watching his match the other day, I think with the 
I can't remember who it was, but he did it. He did exactly what he showed me 10 years ago, and it's a recent match. That he, that he, and it's just incredible how, you, how good you guys got at putting the triangle in a way that wasn't done in jiu-jitsu typically. Yeah. It was never done that way. Most people, when they think of the triangle, think of the front triangle. Yeah, face to face. They miss the fact that there's four other kinds of triangle which are just as good. And they're just as, they're position. better because they're less known. Yeah. Actually, it, it's incredible. I find that the, the, the leaps you guys made and... Um, it was really, and that, that's why I, my favorite martial arts team ever is DDS. Like, I love watching the guys. Like, honestly, like, I know they're, they're no more. For those of you who don't know, they, they've dissipated. Maybe we could talk about that later. But the entertainment factor of watching them grapple, like, my favorite match of all time in jiu-jitsu is Gary Tonin versus Paul Harris. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I want to tell you something, guys. When they booked that match, I was seriously considering calling John and asking him to cancel that match. Why? I'll tell you why. <laughs> For those of you, you guys know Paul Harris. You're watching this, you should know Paul Harris. I felt he's a lunatic. He's going to miss weight. He's going to come on massive amounts of steroids. Not allegation, guys. He's been busted for steroids in the past. Am I right? We have scientific data, guys. The guy's been flagged for steroids. He's not going to make weight because there's no monetary incentive for him to make weight. And if he catches Gary's heel, which is not impossible. I know you guys are more sophisticated. There's a difference between being effective and being technical. But the man is incredibly effective. And if he catches Gordon's, uh, Gary's heel, he'll cripple him. No matter, even if the ref, even if he taps or the referee stops, tries to tries to stop the match, he'll cripple him. And I actually was like an inch away from calling you and asking you to try. Uh, uh, you, you didn't need to worry because about a dozen other people did call. Yeah, me I assume. <laughs> and I asked assumed. me to cancel the fight. I, I remember um, uh, on like a Tuesday morning when G Gary's given the offer after class, I called Gary aside and I was like, Gary. Um, you know, you're talking about the match with Paul Yaris. Um, are you sure you want to do this? And he was like, absolutely. And I said, you know that this is going to be different from other fights. And he's like, yep. And I said, um, you know, if he catches you, <laughs> he'll break your leg. He'll, he'll There's no stopping. He'll try to break your leg. And for, for Gary the... was just like, don't even, he, he said, if, if I don't go with this guy and beat him, no one's going to believe in our leg lock system. And uh, he just went out fearlessly and uh, dominated all the leg lock exchanges. Not only that, uh, Paul Harris was fading. Yeah. If there, if there, was, if if there was no time limit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No if there was 10 minutes more, because yeah. he's a big guy. Like Gary was clearly winning the exchanges and it was getting more and more in Gary's favor. I, I argue, honestly, my favorite match of all time, I'll tell you why. I felt like the principles of Jiu Jitsu were on display. Literally, at one point, for those of you who haven't seen the match, you must watch. It's a must watch match. He literally, picture the Hulk grabbing a human being and throwing him, and Gary kind of rolls, hits the ground, and kind of yeah. rolls, and he's just back on him. And it was like Spider Man versus the Hulk. If I, I, always, if I, I can. Always, <laughs> um, What's that? Uh, I always give my students um, a, a, a mental image that I want them to carry into every fight they go into. And the image that I gave Gary for that fight was the ball. Mm. He said, Pajaris is going to attack you like a pit bull. Mm. A pit bull can't damage a ball. He can't mm. get his mouth around it. And if he throws it up near, it just bounces. There are no edges. And when he got picked up, he just bounced like a ball. Well, and I guess Pajaris would have crippled, crippled him if he could. Oh, yeah. He's in, he's in that case. Like, uh, guys, I tell you, I, I mean, I have res uh, you know, we, all, we all have respect. You, you want to beat your opponent, but you don't want to injure him. Pajaris would actively injure his opponents. I mean, that's the truth. I hate to say it, but... If you watch his fight with Jake Shields, I mean, you could tell like, what a ferocious guy he is. Yeah. Like, he's a, he's a violent human being. And I don't want to talk negative about him, but that's one reason why I really didn't want that match to happen, actually. I know, I know you must have got a lot of calls, but I was actually going to petition you not to let this fight happen. And uh, uh, one of the great things for us is that things that seem incredibly dangerous, if you know what you're doing, and you know where you're safe and where you're not safe, you can make things that seem incredibly dangerous to most people mm. seem quite innocuous. Mm -hmm. And as long as you keep your feet and hands and elbows and knees inside your opponents, you're never going to be in danger. And if you look at that match, that's exactly what Gary did. There was another DDS moment that was legendary. Keenan Cornelius versus Gordon Ryan, no time limit. Mm. You remember it's this? Going of course back you a long way. Yeah. Of course you remember yeah. this match. Where did it take place again? Was it in Canada? It, no, it was in New York City. New York City. Yeah. New York City. Downtown New York City. No time limit. Arguably one of the most technical grapplers at the time, Kenyon Cornelius, another legend in the sport.
taking on a young Gordon Ryan, which he wasn't black belt yet. No. What, what belt was he? I believe he was a recent brown belt. A recent brown belt. And... Okay, John, sorry, we got cut off because of a malfunction in the computer, but we're talking about Cornelius, Keenan Cornelius, never been defeated in a no time is a match match. Uh, a legend, probably pound for pound, one of the top five best grapplers at the time. Going up against a young Gordon Ryan. Gordon Ryan at the time was a, probably a newly minted brown belt, roughly, yes. at that time. No time limits match. Leg locks allowed. New York City, what happened? Um, I remember before the match, talking to Gordon about it, he, he just had absolute confidence in his ability to win. And the idea that he would lose didn't even occur to him. Um, Interestingly, Keenan came in with the similar levels of confidence, and those always make for interesting matches. Mm -hmm. When when both guys mm -hmm. in their in their minds truly believe that they are unbeatable, and that the the athlete in front of them can never defeat them, you always get very interesting matches. And technically, this is still pretty early in Gordon's career. They were a match for each other for mm -hmm. the first hour, but somewhere at about the one hour mark. Mm -hmm. You it was could, very back and forth the yes, first hour. Yes. You could clearly see Keenan develop the belief that he had no method of winning this fight. Now, ordinarily, in a normal match, if you believe I have no method of winning this fight, it's a simple matter of, okay, just go to the end and mm -hmm. lose a decision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you walk away with your pride intact. But a no time limit match is very, very different. When you start to believe in a no time limit match, I have no method of winning this fight, your morale just crashes. I remember you talking to me and George about this when we were younger. You kept telling us that in a no time limit match, you trust Hodger Gracie's Jiu Jitsu the most. This is way back in the day. And you used to tell us because defense was so important. You kept highlighting the importance of Hodger Gracie's ability. It's almost impossible to tap him. Like it's, he, he has that ability of, of, uh, I don't know how you would call it, his, his defense is so his, strong, he can be confident yeah. enough that he's going to win or he's going to draw. Like, he can't lose. Yeah. Uh, I've said to, to, this, to you and George on so many occasions, the basis of your confidence in any match is directly proportional to your confidence in your defense. If you believe at any given moment you can lose a match, you're going to be nervous the whole fight. Mm. But if you walk in saying this guy has no method of beating me, then the only question in your mind is how long will it take you to win? Mm. That's the only question you have. At worst, you run out of time, but you can't get beat. Yeah, but in no time limit match. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. The DDS guys were so impossible to get subbed. Like it was so difficult. Like I think I, uh, I can remember only one, maybe one match coming to mind. Uh, I think it was when Gary subbed Eddie, and or Eddie got subbed once also. In uh, uh, Eddie got caught in an overtime. And right, EBI and, EBI uh, and of course, Gordon also. I mean, everybody gets caught sooner or later, but he he got caught by Pena yeah. or Nicky Choke. But it, it's going to happen. You're going to yeah, it's going to happen. Uh, obviously, it's but, like a boxer. You can be, have the best defensive skills in all time. Someone's going to find your chin at some point. With us, you had trained us so much in control. With them, I felt like they had done so much more time in the submission, both defense and offense, because they were incredibly difficult to sub. Like we would start an armbar or on their back. Like forget about it. They, they knew every nook and cranny how to get out it was it was amazing and uh i think that's what you see in that match like Kenyon can pass his guard he can take his side control on him but so what to what end yeah to what end where does this how does this are we doing this forever for eternity but in their second match actually their second match was very different abu dhabi i thought shooting a double leg on gordon was a horrible mistake yeah a horrible mistake. But also understand the context of it. Gordon was a completely different athlete by then. Mm. Um, when I first taught the squad, I taught them control to submission. The first two athletes I took to ADCC were Eddie Cummings and Gary Tonin. They came in with the philosophy of control leading to submission. Now in, in submission only matches, EBI, that's the perfect philosophy. But ADCC is a completely different rule set. Mm -hmm. ADCC is essentially a merging of wrestling and jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. as opposed to a pure jiu-jitsu match like mm -hmm. EBI where it's just about submitting people. Um, and Eddie 
won his first match with the fastest submission of the tournament. I think in like he beat some uh, Russian Sambo guy in like 15 seconds with a heel hook. Gary brilliantly won by leg lock against Dylan Danis. Uh, his first match. So they both had brilliant yeah. wins in their first matches, but they both lost to experienced mm -hmm. Brazilians in their second match. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get out of the quarterfinals. And so when I left Brazil, I knew that what I had done with these talented young fellows was good enough for, for what they were competing in an EBI. But if they wanted to become legends, they had to go beyond control a submission game and add the idea of a pressure over time game. Mm -hmm. The Gordon Ryan who entered 2017 against Kenan Cornelius had pressure over time as newly built into him, a new kind of... By pressure mindset. over time, you mean like... The ability to exert positional pressure over time that melts your opponent. It's almost like playing chess with that little clock. Mm. Now you, you have a certain amount of time, you're going to make a mistake because I'm pressuring you to make yes. a move right now. Yeah. And um, there's two kinds of pressure that are most important. The first is physical and the second is time. And when you can get those two working in unison, you can melt a man inside of 10 minutes. And Keenan shot, not because he wanted to, but because he had run out of other options mm. and walked right into a gear team that won the match. Um, uh, and so the modern squad is a mix of the old uh, submission <clears throat> rotation along with pressure over time. And we're trying to expand pressure from just ground and also into standing position. That's a continuing project as we speak. So um, uh, now you have a new terminology actually for it. Now we, you refer to it now as uh, scrimmage scrimmaging. Wrestling. Whereas yeah. before, when we were training, we referred to it as situation, single leg situation, half guard situation. But now you added the the the, the new rule set where we have to score points actually. Mm. So now we have a new terminology. Can you define scrimmaging? Like yeah, that? yeah. The idea is that um, when most people talk about takedowns in jiu-jitsu, they, they use kind of like a what I call a bolt-on philosophy where they, they have their jiu-jitsu skills, which is mostly on the ground. And then when you're in a tournament where like ADCC, where you have to exhibit skills in a standing position as well, they go to a local wrestling club and they do some wrestling two months before the competition and they, they take a few wrestling skills that they've learned in a couple of months and bolt them onto their jiu-jitsu game and they hope for the best. You can do okay with that up to a certain level, but it's not the way that I encourage my athletes to think. I think that the standing game should be built into your jiu-jitsu game 365 days a year mm -hmm. rather than just something new and it must be tailored to the to the scoring criteria of jiu-jitsu. The scoring criteria for takedowns and wrestling is substantially different. The techniques are quite similar, but the scoring criteria the cardio is, is different. different. I course. find the cardio is different. The cardio, like I, I get more tired scrimmaging than wrestling. Yes. Because I feel like I have to go a little further than I'm used to. I'm used to take down and relax. It's over. Yeah. And, Scramble is over. And, Start again. Yeah. And, and wrestling is a, a pretty short time frame between the beginning of the takedown and the end result. Yeah. And in jiu-jitsu, the scrambles can go on. for. It goes on for an extra 10 time. seconds, but that 10 seconds could be hell. Yeah. And then there's no guarantee at the end of the 10 seconds because there's no referees. The guy's frantic. Yeah. The guy's frantic. He doesn't want that hook coming in. He doesn't want that pin. He doesn't want it's It's, it's, it's an insane yeah. Yeah. level a, of energy being spent in a few seconds. It's a, it's a fascinating part of the game, and mm -hmm. um, uh, you're starting to see it now with the, uh, the younger generation of ADCC athletes. They're exhibiting it very well. Mm. Now, I, I want to compare a little bit Gary's game with Gordon's game. They're both trained in the same system. They both have many similarities, but they have striking differences. Like, I love Gary, but I see him like he's more of a cowboy. He's a wild man. He's the most entertaining grappler. He's yes. my favorite grappler. He's my favorite grappler, but I feel like if he approached the game like Gordon, which is more method methodical, he would be less entertaining, but maybe he would have won a few key matches because he's got all the technique, he's got all the skill. And actually, rolling, training with Gary is the funnest. If you're in the practice room, Gary's the funnest. Why? Because Gary will like, he'll let you take his back. He'll let you get on top of him. And he'll do this escape over and over again. And he's, he's just phenomenal phenomenal guy who doesn't stop moving he just doesn't stop like you'll never see him be in a static position and hold it no he's always on the next maneuver the next one he's just phenomenal he's my favorite grappler to watch but uh, does this come down to their personalities yeah there's two things that will determine your game your, your personality and your, and your body type um mm. these outside of technique those are the main factors okay so i teach the same techniques to everyone but i also understand that every one of them has a different personality and a different body type and so i Outside of a few fundamental techniques, 
I never impose techniques on people. Mm. I tell them what I like, I tell them what I believe would work for them, but I never impose things upon them. I never say, you, you're learning this. There has only been a few exceptions to that. I forced Gary Tolan to learn a guillotine because he's so good at scrambling, I thought it would be a tragedy if he didn't learn mm. a good guillotine. I, so I forced him to do that. But outside of that, I encourage my students to let their own body type and their own personality organically build their game. But like, like Gordon has like the perfect guard. He says, no, he does a perfect guard. You're not going to beat him. You're not going to pass him. He's either going to sweep you or sub you, but, or it's going to be a draw. Like he, he, he has very few vulnerabilities. I feel like Gary is like, hey, I'm putting game. on a show. We're yeah. coming here. We're going to fight. Yeah. You know, winning is, is yes, it's on the table, but I'm going to come here and like, he has this, he has this different approach, which is wildly entertaining, but might, he might let a point here or there go by yeah. because of it. Part of Gary's uh, modus operandi is to offer opportunities to an opponent. Mm -hmm. And that can create some of the most brilliant victories of all time, and it can also lose you a match. Another favorite match of mine, of all time, I watched it countless times. I refer to it all the time to my students. Gary versus Gilbert Burns. Very different approach than Gordon would have done. Gary willingly lets the guard pass, turns his back. Exposure, exposure. Giving exposure to, to Gilbert Burns. Gilbert Burns, much bigger, much stronger, more experienced. I think Gilbert has more years of training. Oh, yeah, He's a black belt longer than Gary. I think he was a black belt longer than Gary been doing jiu-jitsu. Yeah. How are you going to beat this guy who's bigger, stronger, didn't make weight, if I remember correctly? Yeah. Um, He's just physically bigger. He knows everything you're, you you do. Like he's been doing jiu jitsu longer than you. Maybe not the same style, but Gary gives him exposure, exposure over and over again. Just so confident. And 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 Gilbert is known for rear naked choke and smash passing. Like, just take it. Go ahead. Try to take my back. And those of you who didn't see the match, you have to watch it. He ends up br brilliantly spinning into a uh, rolling into a leg, putting on a heel hook. No man could no man could resist that heel hook. Like I mean, it's on. Your leg is gonna break. It's not going to be a pain yeah. thing. The, the knee's going to break. And he gets the tap. Incredible victory. But if that was Gordon, let's say pound for pound, I think Gordon would win too, but he would have won in a very different way. But yeah. they're both training the same system. But very different personalities. Very different, very different personalities. But it's amazing because Gordon would have just played guard and eventually I think gets in the legs or sweeps. But two guys in the same system all the time and two different... Gary may be more, more entertaining, but Gordon, I think, more point-oriented. Yeah. Like, he'll get, to, he'll, get the, he'll get the points on the board in a, more often, I would say. Yeah, Gordon is the more high-percentage approach. Gary is the more entertaining approach. Um, interestingly, after that match, Gilbert Burns came up and talked to us. He's a lovely guy. And he came up and uh, he said, man, I, I was winning that whole match. And he's like, I don't know where you just got me with that damn heel hook. And, um, <laughs> You're going to have to speak up a little bit. Sorry. Somebody. And uh, so we were, we, we showed him in the lobby of the hotel. The, oh, really? The role in, and he was just like, what? like crazy. It is. It, 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 I mean, I've, uh, those are old school moves, but done in a new way. Done in yeah. a way, like honestly, the way he did it, the way he came back, he rolled and Gilbert based. I would have went back to guard. No, Gary pulls back, like he reverses the action, gets into that heel beautifully. Like I, I watched it. I don't know how many times I've watched it. And the Ashi Grammy entry from Gut Wrench. Yes. Where he kind of goes into a wrestling switch but pulls an Ashi. That kind of stuff, man, it's so fatiguing. I'm on top of you. I'm gut wrenching you. You're supposed to be under attack. You're supposed to be and under pressure. Suddenly you're fighting your way out of All of a sudden, the guy's on my leg and I'm trying to get out of this position. It's yeah. fatiguing because gut wrench usually, usually is fatiguing for the guy on the bottom. I'm about to jump on your back. Gilbert Burns, who, who wants that guy on his back? Nobody. And he t turns it into a switch, keeps the scrambles going. Not very, not something Gordon would have done, I think, in gut wrench. Like, I, don't, I don't think we've ever seen Gordon in gut wrench. But what does Gordon do in gut wrench, let's say? Uh, he probably would have had double trouble. Uh, he's also a big fan of Grammy roles. Um, right. He would have taken a safer option. Safer option. Sure. With yeah. Gary, kill, attack. <laughs> I love him. You got to love him for it, man. He's a, he's a real Rambo. He's a real, uh, he's a real commando out there. Um, what, look, I, I got to ask you, what, what made the DDS so special? They're, they had a super great entertainment uh, factor. They were winning all the time. I can't even remember one of them losing, to be honest with you, like, uh, especially in, like, in the EBIs. I feel like... I think... Um, uh, there were a bunch of factors here. First, they were always the underdogs because they had only been training for a very short period of time. Right. Um, when Eddie, Gary, 
uh, Gordon and Nikki first came to me, they were they were very very young and they were very inexperienced. Mm. And this, uh, I think, the most accomplished was Gary. He had he had won some tournaments as a brown belt. He was a brown belt at the time. He, he I remember was it. the most accomplished. But Gordon, and he was, was he was a half guard player. Yeah, yeah. He mostly used to scramble from half guard. To yeah, the back. I remember. Um, you brought him to TriStar once upon a time. Yeah, yeah for the Nick Diaz fight. I remember putting him yeah. to sleep in the dark on the mat. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I could do that today. No, don't believe me. He's repaid me back many times over. But he was a great grappler, but good potential. But but he was essentially he was a half guard guy with a back back control. Yeah. Like he had a good arena control. They they called him the what did they call him? The lion name? killer. Lion killer. He had, that's his. That was his yeah. sub. He didn't yeah. have much, he didn't he have did, no he leg just locks. Pull bottom half guard. Roll left and right. Squirm his way to the back and go for a yeah. Leg. Great back taker. No leg locks at the time. And. Um, uh, so I think part of the appeal was, okay, they were always the underdog because they had trained for, for far less time than all of their opponents. None of them had trained more than like mm. uh, three or four years when they first uh, came out, uh, with the exception of Gary Tonin. And um, secondly, they had something that was different. Okay, they were, they, were, they were using, leg locks weren't new, but they were using them in ways where people looked at and said, they're doing something different. The patterns and entries were different, John. Yeah. We didn't know them. We were watching it and we're like, we trained with John. We never learned that, you know? And I remember, but you guys were in the MMA program. We're in the MMA program. We're not as we're not as. This was like a specialized yeah, submission. It, it, it was it was it was it was a it was a it was a new way of doing things. Yeah. So I think um, one was the underdog factor. Two was the innovation factor. They mm -hmm. were doing things differently. And three was the aggression factor. These kids were coming out. They weren't looking yes. to win by advantage. They were looking to to, yeah. to get to you and, and which, make you submit. Which honestly. Was wildly entertaining. Yes, super good. Like think about it for us. In your first day in jujitsu, when you came in and you looked at it, and you were like, "Hey, I, I thought it was gay at first when I first saw it." <laughs> when we were, when we, I first saw it, we won't like, cover what are these that. guys doing on the ground? <laughs> we won't cover that. But uh, okay, let me talk about my you know experience. <laughs> <laughs> let me talk about my experience. <laughs> <laughs> be honest. I mean, <laughs> okay. You know, we were like, "What is when, this?" When I first entered, I, I was like, "Okay, I, I, I want to pursue this. This is interesting." And what made me want to pursue it over time was the idea of submission holds. The prime mm -hmm. appeal of jiu-jitsu was the idea of making the other guy quit. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, I, yes. I, I didn't. Then I didn't it's manly. Then I'm like, yeah, you know what? That, this, this is very manly. I, I didn't want to learn jiu-jitsu to learn how to get an advantage by getting to half guard. Yeah, and, and holding like, a guy down. Yeah, like, that, that has no appeal. <laughs> All of us. I think everyone watching this this uh, uh, this podcast will agree that the prime appeal that makes you do jujitsu, it makes it interesting, it makes it worthwhile studying, is the idea of control to submission. And no one's interested in people that win by advantage or by the minimum amount possible. They want the maximum result, which is submission. And the squad had the philosophy that they were only interested in winning by submission. And so I think there was the underdog factor. Um, uh, there, there was the uh, the aggression factor, the fact that they were always constantly looking for submission, and there was the innovation factor, that they were doing it in a way which was substantially different from everyone else in the sport. I think that those three things are the, are the prime appeal of the squad. I, I also really liked Eddie Bravo's approach to overtime. I thought that also gave a stage to make things more like a shootout. They, I remember talking to him about it. He's like, he's like I'm going to make it like a soccer game, a penalty shootout. And I think that also the day had to end with somebody most of the time getting tapped. Um, I love the appeal of having a no time limit uh, sub only, but who has three hours? Yeah, no one. It, it sometimes it's, it's the matches will be literally hours long. Uh, I think it was a great um, a great uh, platform to really show how entertaining jujitsu can be. Because you're right, nobody wants to see two guys lying down on top of each other with no end. Mm. Like I scored a point on you, and I'm going to lock you down, buckle you down and let the time run out, it, it, that gets boring. Um, but the DDS were far from that. They were, it, it seemed like every time somebody escaped a, a submission, they would follow right back into another. And uh, it, was, it was wildly entertaining. Interestingly, um, all three of the students I had into EPI, Gary Tonin, Gordon Ryan, and Eddie Cummings, uh, were able to secure all matches won by submission in regulation. Gary on mm -hmm. multiple occasions. Um, they were the only athletes who were able to do this, I believe. And what was the time of the game? It was 10 minutes. 10 minutes, which is a pretty long match. By yeah, by yeah, it's very tough. Hands. It's very tough. But what's the difference between DDS and New Wave? Now you're 
You're going by a new wave. Yeah, it, it, there's, there's, you guys stylistically, are, there's no difference. It's just uh, there was there was a series of um, uh, growing personality conflicts within the uh, within the squad, which uh, caused a rift over time, and uh, everyone agreed that ultimately the best way to, to cure the rift was separation. Mm. Unfortunately, yeah, that was sad. Um, there was something special about that group. Yeah, uh, there was. I, I, I do. I do think that something magic was lost when they separated. There's no question. Is there, and you don't have to answer, is there any hope for reconciliation? Uh, the DDS getting together again? I, I, for I'm one last know. storm of the tournaments? <laughs> Maybe we, we work together for three months. It's, we do this one tournament. And it'll be a the long DDS versus some other, the world. <laughs> DDS versus the world. How about this? DDS gets together for 60 days. DDS versus the world. That would be an, an amazing <laughs> documentary, let me tell you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, and I believe that most people, given time, uh, conflict tends to resolve itself over time. So I, I'm confident that over time things will get resolved. But uh, currently, uh, they have a gym, they operate, they, uh, they do the same thing we used to do when we were together in New York and Puerto Rico. And uh, they seem to be doing a great job of it. And um, they're happy living their lives. And we're happy doing what we do. And that's what it's all about. Amazing. I want to talk to you also about Hensel. Um, his personality shines in his grappling, no doubt. Absolutely. The way he grapples, he's a pit bull. Like he's just a, uh, he's just a savage. What was it like training with Henzo in the practice room? It was, it was fantastic. Um, I, I'm very lucky. For those of you who don't know, I so only speak had, a little louder, so, just a little sorry. bit. Um, I only had one instructor in my life. Um, the first gym I went into was the gym that I stayed for the rest of my career. I, mm. I was not someone who went all over the place. Um, my first instructor was uh, Henzo Gracie, and he was, in fact, my only instructor. And when I first came into jiu-jitsu, my only interest was to learn enough jiu-jitsu to be able to be able to win street fights. I was working as a bouncer in New York City in the early 1990s, and um, so I had no ambitions to be involved in jiu-jitsu other than to learn how to strangle people and and uh, get out of pins and and hold people down, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, uh, I went in with very low expectations, and uh, they had a great group of guys. They were um, even early on. Henzo uh, had people like uh, Matt Serra and others who were very talented. They, I believe Matt was a blue belt when I entered, and uh, but he was one of the best guys on the East Coast. And um, uh, as I spent more time there, I, be, I, I became a training partner to. Matt Serra, Rodrigo Gracie, mm -hmm. and Ricardo Almeida, and Henzo himself, and um, we would often train together. Um, Henzo had a brilliant and dynamic game, he used to move beautifully. There's something different about an athlete who started training when they're five years old. Mm -hmm. they, they have that, that element to their game which comes from childhood training where they, they, they fight on an instinctual level where all their instincts go in the right direction, as opposed to someone like me who started at 28 where you have no instincts. You have to figure things out over time. And um, so my game was always more like a, a, a slow analytical game, whereas Henzo was like a fast dynamic. He was more game. DDS, I would say, no? <laughs> would you say? He was a DDS. Uh, I mean, he, 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 he was a killer. He was just pure, yes. pure he offer. Put, he like, put a strong emphasis on submission holds. That's something yeah. I never forgot from him. He also put a very strong emphasis on the idea that jiu-jitsu had to be effective in both gi and no gi. Mm -hmm. and, um, and combat, like yes, real combat. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and he also gave me great freedom to try anything, mm -hmm. provided I could prove that it worked. And um, uh, and uh, fairly soon after that, uh, Matt Serra, Rodrigo Gracie, and Hikaru Almeida moved away to open up their own school. So Henzo asked me to start teaching uh, full time. Uh, I was in their PhD program at Columbia University at the time, and I had to make a decision as to which direction I would go. Mm -hmm. So um, I went with jujitsu, and um, amazing. Uh, so I started teaching full time, and then soon after that, I met you, crazy guy. <laughs> What was Hensel's greatest fight? I have my favorite fight of his. Hmm. Yeah, fight or grappling match? No, fight. We have to go by fight first because okay. he was a real fighter. Yeah, yeah. Hensel has the biggest, the, he's the most guts I've ever seen in a yeah. human being. Yeah. He'll fight anybody, yeah. anytime, anywhere, any place. What was his best fight? Um, um, MMA fight. Let's start okay. with MMA. The, the most memorable one will always be his, his fight with Sakuraba because um, uh, 
it was a fight where Hinzo was winning. It was a hit on, yeah. on all three judges' cards. Um, yeah. It was a very, very close fight. This was at the peak of Sakuraba's uh, career. Mm -hmm. uh, Hinzo was... Uh, Henzo was always used to fight well above his weight category. He should yeah. have fought at 145 pounds. Uh, Henzo he won't cut weight. Like he yeah, he care. refuses to cut weight and considers it disgraceful. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> We're so. here eating salads and, and doing aerobic, and he's like, <laughs> so um, he fought, uh, you know, people much larger than himself. So he's fighting soccer. He's a hit on all three cards, and all he had to do was hold on at mm. the end, and he would have won. Yeah, but instead he went for an attack and got caught and um, uh, had his arm badly broken and refused to submit. Um, so I think that one shows both his character and his technique uh, in a very good light. He went with someone bigger, stronger than himself, um, was able to do extraordinarily well to the point where he was judged ahead on all three judges' cards, but also shows his character in so far. He wasn't satisfied with just uh, winning by decision. He went for the finish mm. and it cost him. And then in that cost, he showed something else, which is true to his character, which is great personal bravery. Uh, so I think it, it showed it almost every aspect of his, uh, of the strong mm. features of himself as a man and as a, uh, as, as a jiu-jitsu fighter. My favorite fight of Henzo has to be, I think, the Pat Notish fight. Hmm. That was later in his career. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because he came back later in his career. He beat a former UFC champion who was also later in his career. It was the fight, like, what would have happened if they met years ago? And we always had that question. And I, when I think Henzo, I think guillotine. Like, the one guy you don't want to wrap your, you don't want him wrapping your neck. Yes. He had an outstanding arm and guillotine. He's you don't, great early yeah, innovators of it. You don't want Henzo to wrap up your neck. Like, he'll, he'll crush you. I remember I've rolled with him once. I had the luxury of rolling in with him once. And it, like, obviously he knows every sub, but guillotine, like you're not getting out. Yeah, particularly the Armin guillotine. Mm. That, was his, that was his forte. He actually rematched Sakuraba after that. I was there actually in, in Metamoris. In a match, yes. In a Metamoris, yeah. and he beat him handedly. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. Henzo, he's a... If you guys ever met Henzo, if you've ever been in the practice room, he's such a special guy. Yes. Very special guy. He makes... Yes, he's probably the most charismatic person in Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, he makes everybody believe. Yeah. No, we're going to be successful. He's like he's a natural uh, leader. He 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 brings people together. It's it's incredible. His energy it's it's really amazing. Um, you've rolled. I mean, you've trained with so much top talent, so many legends of the sport. The the greatest minds in Jiu Jitsu. All you've worked with them all. Uh, notably one Hodger, you've trained many times mm, with Hodger, yeah. you know him very, very well. Um, Hodger uses the most basic tactics at the most advanced level. I've, I've gotten to work with him as well, like, I mean, the subtleties that he brings to the table, like, let's say armbar. After seeing him do armbar, I realized I do armbar wrong, even though I've been doing it for 15 years. Like what? what do you, he calls it invisible jiu-jitsu, if I remember correctly. What do you? What do you? Do you, do you have a term for that? Like things, the subtleties yeah, yeah, of. Yeah. of it's, it's the thing about Hodger is that um, many people will look at him and say, "Ah, oh, he just does basic jiu-jitsu really well." Um, yeah, that's true. But it, um, what what he really does is he puts limits on the number of avenues he will explore in jiu-jitsu. Mm. But by limiting the number of avenues, he vastly increases the sophistication that he can bring to those avenues. And um, uh, he has a good understanding of what is high percentage technique. Uh, you know, there's 10,000 techniques you can learn in Jiu-Jitsu, but the number of truly high percentage techniques is probably less than 100. And he'll just put all of his emphasis on those. And uh, I believe absolutely that's the right way to approach Jiu-Jitsu. Um, you're not rewarded in jiu-jitsu so much for the breadth of your knowledge as you are for the depth of your knowledge. And uh, it would be very naive indeed to say that Hodja has a simple game. He has an extremely sophisticated game in a very set number of areas. And um, If he gets you there, he knows more than you. Yes, yes. And this is far more important in jiu-jitsu than how, how many, you know, I, I would rather know a lot about a few things in jiu-jitsu. I can't, I can't think of one match he's lost except Jacare. I think he lost to Jacare once. Um, he lost to Zandre Ribeiro a couple of times, mostly on tactics. Really? Okay, um, I haven't seen that. Yeah, but even when he lost, it was, he lost because he didn't care about anything other than winning by submission. If he just played tactics, he would have won. Wait, is he the most winning grappler of all time? Uh, 
I he's would, arguably the greatest of all yeah, time. Yeah, he did arguably. have some losses. I know he was never submitted uh, past black belt. Um, so, I mean, everyone loses a few, but uh, he was never submitted past black belt. Which is incredible. Um, by itself, it's an incredible achievement. And um, uh, he must be out there. And then there's very, very few times he lost. You know, the, 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 I remember the early Abu Dhabis. The guys who won were always gi guys. It was very, it was a, it was a very historical moment when Gordon won, because he was not doing gi. Mm. And not only did he win, he crushed everybody. Like he won in stunning fashion. And did that dispel the myth that you have to do gi? Because he used to tell us when we were younger, you have to do gi if you want to get good at jiu-jitsu. Even if your goal is MMA, even if your goal is no gi jiu-jitsu. And I was, I, was, I was always very skeptical of that. I was like, you guys won because you've been doing it longer than us. We're going to catch up to you quick. And I, I see it as two different sports, like judo and wrestling. Yes, they're interrelated. Yes, it's okay to cross-train. I'm not against cross-training at all. I remember you telling me to put on the gi some because it helps you with defense, and I, and I agree to that, and I, and I would do some gi. But fundamentally, you have to focus mostly on no gi if that's what you want to do as a goal, as an end goal. Absolutely. What do you think about that? Have you changed um, your mind over, this, over no, the years? Or? No. Um, uh, I mean, the argument that somehow training a gi would magically make you more technically adept without a gi just makes zero sense. It makes no sense to me. Um, the, there's a, otherwise, judo players would win every wrestling tournament. And actually, I've seen the opposite. I've seen guys work with the gi, then take it off, and their game fall apart. Where I said, tell guys, start with no gi, learn the fundamentals, and then do gi. Because to me, the gi can be a crutch as well. If, let's yeah. say you, you spend a year, two, three years developing your game, the spider guard game or whatever, lapel guard or whatever, galaxy guard, worm guard, and all of a sudden we take it off. Now you've, you, you're, you're, you're completely lost. Yeah. There's, 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 an, there's an ironic end to the story that you just told for us. When we were young, oh, sorry, I was never that young. <laughs> <laughs> when you were young, um, uh, we were always told if you want to be good, no gi, you've got to train in the gi. It'll make you more technical somehow. Mm -hmm. This has never explained how, but it was just st stated. Now that Gordon has won everything, no gi, the story has changed. Now they say to him, well, the only reason you're winning is because you specialize in it, and we have to spend half of our training time in the gi. Now it's exactly. a disadvantage. Like, Wait a minute, what happened to the old story from, yeah. from years ago? I think it was, a, it was in a way like, it'll take you 20 years to catch up if there's a gi. I think a lot of the students... A lot of the instructors were intimidated because back then, for those of you who don't know, like just 15 years ago, 10 years ago, they didn't do lower body submissions and they needed the gi to keep off these young athletic kids that were not only doing jiu-jitsu but also doing conditioning. Because in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it was weird. There was no conditioning program. Whereas judo, wrestling, you cannot find an elite wrestling club, an elite judo club, an elite boxing club that doesn't do conditioning. Show me any combat sport other than jiu-jitsu. There's always an embedded conditioning program. They're doing abs, they're running, they're doing... But no, not in jiu-jitsu. In jiu-jitsu, you go in there, half an hour technique, 45 minutes technique, a little bit of rolling, go home, students, you're done for the day. And I feel like when MMA guys were doing jiu-jitsu, they wanted to put the gi on us because, hey... We can control them with the gi on. Without the gi, a lot of our techniques don't work. They double leg us, they get on top, and we give them a, a really difficult time. I remember being like a, a young purple belt and going with black belts and dominating them even, you know, winning, like, because without the gi, they couldn't, they couldn't use half their techniques. And uh, now, especially with uh, the new innovations in jiu-jitsu, it seems like it's, it's changed. Like, you have to know these positions. Um, so many ticks, so many grips, the way you guys grab from butterfly guard, etc. It's, it, it's, it's innovated. The jiu jitsu is working without the gi, you know, and uh, I, 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 that's what I love most. I'm not a huge fan of the gi. I really not. A huge, are you, are you training with the gi now uh, once in a while still? Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, John yeah. knows every detail about gi. He's a gi expert. You've done gi all the time. I actually uh, misunderstood thing that is, is around 60% of the classes I taught over my career yeah. were gi classes. You know? Yeah, I remember he would teach gi and no gi at Hensel's. Me and George would go to the no gi because we're interested in MMA. We would do some gi. I remember I, I did some gi with you, but um, even then it was frowned upon to give belts without a gi. Yes. Now right, we give yeah. it freely without a gi. Yeah. But back then it was a very controversial topic. If the guy's not wearing gi, he can't promote. He can't promote this guy. Uh, but you know, obviously we moved away from that. Yeah.
um, also I just put a very low emphasis on belts in general I just think they're yeah. kind of a waste of time so um, uh, no one really cares about you're, it you're gonna have to speak up a little bit I'm not sorry buddy it's okay it's okay he doesn't like not a, I remember asking John hey John what do we do about degrees of black belts you know I was like, ah. we don't even talk about that okay it's a non-subject <laughs> we don't talk you got your black belt that's it shut up about it okay good okay there's no degrees um, man, there's just so much history the, the Hensel Gracie Academy was just so much like who is the most influential grappling trainer you had outside of Hensel because I mean you worked with everybody from Braulio, Hodger like the who's who of grappling all the mm. Gracies I mean you've, you've worked with every single one of them almost that's a great question after um, Hensel who was your biggest influence um, I think uh, it's really uh, I only had one ins true instructor that was Hensel um, uh, Rodrigo Gracie was uh, someone who had a big influence on me when I was uh, beginning the sport, white and blue belt. He was the one that convinced me to work hard on butterfly guard and, and mm -hmm. to X guard. Um, and from X guard came all the entanglements that we were today. He had a big influence. Ricardo Almeida uh, always told me, John, you're, you're strong, but you're too stiff. And to emphasize a much more relaxed body disposition in, in training he had a big influence on me in that regard um, Matt Serra had a big influence on me on the idea of uh, never accepting bottom position unless forced to do so um, the idea being that when most people sit to guard position they just say oh I, I'm the guy working from guard so I'm going to play bottom position the other guy plays on top um, Matt Serra from an early time in my career said that there's no there's no law that says because you started on bottom you gotta stay on bottom you can heist up and get top position at any given moment and this had a big influence on me and started to create a strong front headlock game in me so they definitely had very strong influences um, uh, Dean Lister had a big impact on me uh, despite only meeting him once for a very very short period of time just a very superficial conversation had a big influence on me um, Hodger Gracie uh, uh, had a huge influence insofar as he really showed the idea of defense first and defense is the basis of your, of your entire game in jiu-jitsu um, uh, the idea being if, if your opponent cr can't crack you at your weak points over time you will eventually crack him at his and uh, that was a critical insight uh, that I carried with me throughout my time um, I gained a lot just from people that I never met. Um, people that when we prepared uh, mm -hmm. George to find that BJ Penn had a big influence mm -hmm. on the, the early idea of trapping arms. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so th those are some of the major people that because, I Because I mean, you fundamentally, I mean, the DDS changed the face of Jiu Jitsu. You, get, you cr guys created trends. And uh, definitely in the leg lock world, that's undeniable, undeniable. And the back system was actually a huge leap forward in jiu-jitsu the way you systematically created a, a, a go-to if you're here you go there if you go, if you're here you must go here almost chess like what's the next trend we <laughs> we should be seeing from the way uh, what's I, the I, next uh, yeah. curveball you're throwing you, you, us you're already seeing it the integration of uh, uh, of wrestling and jiu-jitsu scrimmage through scrimmaging uh, using wrestling technique uh, applied to a jiu-jitsu scoring criteria which is basically your answer to the Abu Dhabi rules yes mm. is Gordon Ryan the greatest grappler of all time no gi yes no gi yes I would agree with you he's, our, he's the greatest grappler of all time his finishing rate is it's insane insane I was just watching his final of Abu Dhabi uh, against uh, forgetting the, the guy's name the guy who plays butterfly guard um, uh, Gordon Nee tapped him twice in the final what's his name again sorry uh, do you remember the uh, oh, Brazilian Ma guy? Marcelo Studer? Yeah, Marcelo Studer. Um, he knee tapped him twice. Vinicius. Yeah. Smash pass. Uh, the, he went for a leg lock. Yeah. Uh, Gordon took his back. Beautiful escape. I mean, uh, it's incredible how he makes a world class guy look almost, you know, uh, defenseless. For us, I could tell you stories of the training room <laughs> where I've people seen it. come in. I've been a victim, believe me. I know. Like, I've seen it. I've been a victim. It's incredible. Yeah, right? no, he's incredible. Yeah. Nice. And you know he was he was special. I remember I remember him as a purple belt. You told me he's going to be a world champion. Yeah, you know, I remember um, you telling me that. I remember when Gordon I think was eighteen or nineteen, and I think he was a purple belt. There was an ADCC legend, one of the greatest um, ADCC competitors, 
Raise your voice a bit. Uh, came in to train, and he goes to me, John, who should I who should I train with? And I said, why, why don't you train with this kid here, Gordon? And he said, okay. So he goes over, and Gordon submits him like three times in five minutes. Wow. He comes over, and he sits next to me, and he goes, who is that guy? And I go, that's Gordon Ryan. And he goes, <laughs> who is Gordon Ryan? Like that. <laughs> so like, easy there. What made um, him so special? Um, I mean, he was training hard. Yeah. But so many guys with other guys. Many guys are training hard. Many guys. Yeah. I'm telling you guys, when yeah. you go to Hensel's at that time, it was, if you were a black belt and you had 10 wins in a row, you were nothing. You were just a regular Joe. There were so many killers from every walk of life, wrestlers, judokas, Greco guys, grapplers, triangle experts, rubber guard experts, uh, inverted guard experts, any expert you want, smash passers. Every walk of life was in that room. There was no room to wrestle. Something magical about that time, John. I was yeah. talking about it yesterday. I, there was something so magical. There was MMA guys, jiu-jitsu guys. Like it was just so magical. At the head of it all was John Denner. Believe me, guys were... There was many hardworking guys, but we had one guy surface, Gordon Ryan. What made him so special? I, I think it's a fascinating question. Um, part of it, I believe, is he has an extraordinary memory. Mm -hmm. um, on more than a few occasions, Gordon will come up to me after class and be like, hey, John, you remember that thing you showed me in 2018? when the guys uh, uh, on left Ashigarami and you advocated a turnout uh, in, in the opposing direction. And I'm looking at, I can't remember a goddamn thing. I, 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 he remembers years ago in the month you thought it Yeah, time. and he, he remembered it better than I taught it to him. Mm. And uh, he'll have to jog my memory so I can mm -hmm. try and teach it back to him. Um, so he has an incredible ability to recall information. Secondly, he has an incredible ability to stay calm under stress. Mm. Um, problem solving is difficult enough as it is. You make it more difficult when you stress yourself. And so athletes who can cope with stress or downplay stress always solve problems better. And he is truly extraordinary in this regard. Um, he does have good physical attributes for the game that he plays. He's actually quite slow and his coordination is uh, nothing, nothing to write home about. Um, in many ways, he would, if, if you took him through standardized athletic testing, he would actually be quite poor. Mm -hmm. But he has incredible isometric tension and the ability to hold it for long periods of time. And his entire game is based around that. So he's t he says, okay, my body's good at two things. And I'm going to base my whole game around those two things. So he does a, a tremendous job of structuring the technique to uh, the special attributes of his body. Um, uh, so these are some of the things which, which account for his, his success. And of course, the greatest one of them all, the most important one, he's a natural problem solver. Mm. He, he has very good practical solutions to problems. When he runs into problems, he'll think sometimes we'll troubleshoot together we'll experiment with things and go back and forth and he's just a natural problem solver he's also has a very unique passing game like when i watch him pass i'm i'm, I'm amazed you know he makes it look e easy and he's passing like world-class guys yes which is something that's very difficult in jiu-jitsu when you have a world-class guard to pass it's very fatiguing frustrating Guys are flexible. Guys know how to pummel. They know exactly how you're trying to pass them. Like it's almost like he busts us through with ease. Actually, one of the hardest things to do in jiu-jitsu at high level is pass the guard. Yeah. It's very fatiguing. Mm -hmm. but Maybe I don't get physical. swept. Maybe I don't get submitted. But passing you is another thing. He passes like it's almost like butter. Yes. Yeah. It's um, uh, much of it has to do with he he has a great ability to assess relative work rate um, what are the positions I can get into where my opponent is physically working harder than I am and if I can hold those for extended periods of time my opponent will eventually physically shut down and make the task of passing significantly easier it's amazing honestly um, his top game his guard game his escapes 
all of that trained in such a short period of time. His rise to, to the top was very, very fast. And, yeah. I, and I think it has a lot to do with you. Guys, if you don't know John's schedule, we knew exactly. When we would arrive in New York, we knew exactly where he was. He was either in the morning at Hensel's, in the afternoon Columbus Square having lunch, or in the evening at Hensel's. How many hours a day were you in the gym? No, no exaggeration. You were there. Mm -hmm. I usually came in for the morning class at about 7 a.m. And I mm -hmm. usually left around 8 p.m. 8 7 I'm talking almost 12 hours a day of jujitsu. And then you took this game and you distilled it. And then you can take some young kid in three years and turn him into a killer. Like, it was like, almost like, I watched you for 20 years, trial and error, exploration, exploring it. And then you get this young kid comes in. And he's handed this game that's been refined over and over again. And nobody's thinking about jiu-jitsu like this guy. Guys, when you're watching, John, do you own a TV? This man, I remember, at least back in the day, I used to be like, we're in the hotel room. He's like, ah, oh, he's never seen TV before. This man doesn't watch TV. I'll put on the TV. He's like, oh, I've never seen this show. I never seen it. Like, you don't have a TV? I don't have a TV. And I was asking John, what do you do to relax? He goes, I read books. But to, to, to like, you know, blow off stress, what do you do? Read books. That's actually was a, you were a big influence on my, my reading. I started oh, reading a lot good. of books after you. Yeah. I started a lot of reading because John would, he would tell us, you know, uh, John was an amazing uh, influence on me and George. And when we were younger, me and George, we didn't, we weren't so big on the book reading, let's say. But <laughs> I, <laughs> after meeting John, I literally started reading like honestly like seventy books a year. Like I really went heavy into books, especially Audible and all that. And because I was like realizing there's so much to learn out there and he was a huge influence. And I, I also now don't watch TV. Honestly, I, I rarely watch TV. I only watch fights and I've kind of become like a, a smaller version of you. Like I really love to analyze things. And I, of course, I learned it from John. But you were doing that back in the day at, at such an intense level. Think about how much time the average person wastes yeah. in a given day. This is true, guys. This is facts of life here. Listen carefully. Like between television, computer games, you literally gain not a single Nothing. useful element. It's a, it's a waste of time. Yeah. They're, these, they're literally designed to waste your time. And uh, people will devote a third of their day to these activities. If you could yeah. just take that wasted time and learn skills within three years, you could have reinvented who you are as a human being. I mean, what do, you, what do you call that when you distill something and make it so potent and you're taking these young kids and five years, they're black belt level, even less than five years. Like I, I would say like uh, one of your probable belts is higher than, a, I would put your probable belt against a black belt, an average black belt easily. Um, like, I, of course, I've been trying to replicate that model to a lesser degree. Like my probable belts, I trust them against even black belts and it has a lot to do with the way you taught us to be methodical and and good wasn't good enough. It had to be perfect and it had to be a backup plan. And uh, it was just so overly, the preparation was so overly, um, I mean, what's the word for it? Can you be overprepared? Really what I do is I coach according to Pareto's principle. Mm. The idea is that in, a, in an ocean of technique, only a very small percentage of techniques are truly effective across the board for most people, most body types, uh, across all age groups. And you want to devote almost all of your training time and resources into those techniques. And uh, don't get distracted by frivolous or uh, unimportant moves. Focus is everything. If you want to be good quickly, you got to learn focus and it's not just mental focus on technique it's it's the techniques themselves as well which need to be brought into focus what are the truly high percentage techniques of the sport things get interesting here because 20 years ago the leg locks were not considered high percentage mm. but you have to be able to bring in the idea of what is their real high percentage value not what people currently believe then you have to have some kind of ability mm -hmm. to to experiment and say, okay, leg locks actually are a high percentage if you change your approach to them, um, if you make them control-based rather than speed-based. And, uh, uh, and this is what I do. I, that's how you can get someone very it's good almost, in a very short period of time. It's almost like Bruce Lee's daily decrease. Like he used to say, hack away at the unessentials. Yeah. Philosophically, he was correct, I would say. Like 
there's so much to do but if you spend your time trying to do it all you really gotta plan what you're gonna focus on or else it's, hard work is not always good hard work sometimes is a waste of energy uh, but what that said I want to talk about uh, another famous student of yours George St. Pierre mm. very different than Gordon yes very different attributes I would say my, if somebody asked me what made George so successful, there are many things, but one of them was his enthusiasm for training. Yes. I, I he always consider. found a way to pump himself up for training. Like, get, like, he was happy to be there. He was, okay, it was tough. It was certain training camps were hell, yes, but he'd find a way to get that motivation. And he's a very motivating guy in the practice room. He'll beat you up and like, convince you to come back tomorrow. Yeah. Let's do it again. You know, yeah. And he would he would beat you up in a nice way. George yeah. is the sweetest guy in practice. Never hurts his partners. But I wouldn't have trained as hard if it wasn't for George. He would convince me that tomorrow is a good thing to do it again. The whole thing, yeah, the whole thing. From morning to that's like it was an incredible amount of f f training. Yes, yeah. Uh, he was really um, he was the guy that changed the face of mixed martial arts. He's the one mm -hmm. who brought the idea of professional fight games into uh, mm -hmm. MMA. Before that, it was kind of like a cowboy approach where guys just brought in a few buddies. A couple of weeks before a, uh, a fight, um, did whatever kind of random training that they thought was appropriate, and they went in there and fought. George is the first person to bring in specialized experts, uh, employ strategy, tactics. Um, he united everybody. Yeah, yeah. He was, a, he was a remarkable man. An incredible person. Nobody could bring together a practice group like George. Like, um, he, was, he had a magnetic personality. You'd love to help him out. You, he made you feel. He made everybody feel welcome, special, uh, part of the team, part of his success. Um, I've never seen trainers be so happy to see. Like sometimes trainers, they don't want to show you too much. George was the opposite. Oh, show him everything. This is such a good guy. Yeah. Everybody absolutely adored him. There was very little friction in the group, and it had to do a lot to do with his personality. Yeah, he's an, he was an incredible athlete. Not just physically, but in terms of, of creating synergy, like we were talking about the other day. Um, I've never seen an athlete create synergy like him. Yeah. Now, uh, George is an embodiment of um, uh, the old martial arts principle of, of mutual benefit. He mm. would, everyone who came to his camps benefited, and he benefited from them. And uh, that was the, the core principle of everything he did in martial arts. Who was it that was saying, you were telling me it says mutual benefit? Was it, was it Kano? Kano. Kano. Yeah. Kind of the founder of uh, judo. Yeah, that's right. Okay, guys, this is the conclusion. John, I want to thank you so much. Thank you for uh, Give me a hug. <laughs> You're one of my favorite people in the world. I've learned so much from this man. Maybe I get him to do a second podcast. Uh, we've got some time to kill before the fights. Uh, who knows? Maybe I get you guys to, uh, to hear some more of him. Thank you, guys. Please like, share, and comment. Make sure to go to Arab Fanatics. What's, what's it called again? <laughs> BJJ Fanatics. Oh, BJJ Fanatics. It's okay for them to be called Fanatics, but with us, no, all of a sudden, I'm, my website should shut down. <laughs> okay, guys, make sure to check out John's material, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.